Okay, so finally we're, we talked about bacteria and diseases, and um, we're moving on to really the most abundant diseases of plants. That's going to be a fungi, and then we're also going to mention a few about uh, protist infections. So fungi and bacteria are one of the principal decomposers of most organic material. So when things die, they need to be broken down into, well, don't need to, but they are broken down further and further into more and more to be used more and more into un energy. And this is done by, in large part, bacteria and fungi. Um, <clears throat> fungi produce intertwined mass of delicate threads. And these delicate threads are called hyphae. Um, and have a couple different types here. Some of them can have uh, cell walls between them. And those are septate hy hyphae. Hypha. Um, and then some of them do not have uh, separations between them, so they, it's kind of this long mass with multiple nuclei. Um, <clears throat> these are kind of microscopic structures, but they do make this mass of hyphae um, that you can see, and it's usually kind of a whitish in color, and that's called a mycelium. Um, and so the study of fungi is called mycology. You're studying the mycelium and the hyphae and the characteristics of them. So all fungi are filamentous, meaning they make these large strands. Um, or there are some that are unicellular heterotrophs, like yeast. But most of them absorb their food in solution through cell walls. So the way that they do this is they usually secrete enzymes, and that breaks down the material outside of them, and then they um, absorb those nutrients <clears throat> from the broken down um, enzymes what the enzymes did. They all have a uh, chitin in their cell walls, which is similar to what uh, are the same protein that insects have in their exoskeletons. Um, and I mentioned that all of them are filamentous except for some chytrids and yeast cells, and most of them do not lack, mo uh, do not have motile cells, so they don't have uh, cilia or flagella. And DNA studies have shown that they are actually more closely related to animals than with plants, which makes sense because plants have photosynthetic abilities and both animals and fungi are heterotrophs. Now the life cycle of a fungus um, has the alteration of generation similar to plants, um, but they spend most of their life cycle as a haploid individual. Okay, So um, as a haploid they can go through mitosis um, and they can also go through asexual reproduction. They pr produce spores, and those spores can then uh, disperse and form new organisms through the process of germination. But if they do find a compatible um, other um, hyphae, they can form a, a plasmogamy, which is the, the fusion of the cytoplasm. But the nuclei don't um, fuse right away, and so they have this heterokaryotic stage where they have two nuclei in one cell, and they can live for some time in that. But eventually, um, karyogamy will occur where those two nuclei will fuse, and then it will have a diploid organism, which will generally quickly go through meiosis and create that haploid stage again. So most of the life cycle is haploid. Some of it is uh, heterokaryotic or dikaryotic and a, and a small part is diploid. <clears throat> so 85% of plant diseases are caused by fungi so they do have a you know parasitic generally relationship with plants. Fungal disease diseases that are common and some signs are leaf rust and rust is usually a reddish color so you have uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Stem rust um, for example, what's found on wheat, you have wheat stem rust, uh, sclerotinia, which is a white mold, and generally the mildew is powdery, so it creates this kind of fuzz on it that's powdery. Um, some symptoms from fungal diseases include uh, spots on berries caused um, by um, anthracnose, uh, damping of off of the seedlings by phytophthora, a leaf spot by septoria brown spot, and chlorosis yellowing of of leaves. So here are some, again, yellow yellowing of leaves caused by a fungal um, 
infection. All right, so a couple examples of some fungal diseases. Uh, the first one is called corn smut caused by Eustilago um, matis. It uh, infects all parts of the plant, but is most apparent on the actual embryo, the corn itself, the ovaries. Um, and it's a heterokaryotic hyphae, so we mentioned before that heterokaryotic stage. Um, and it forms uh, in the plant after forming conjugation tubes, so tubes that come together to, which is their equivalent of sexual reproduction. Um, they conjugate within the ovary and then they create this smut, that's what it's called. So eventually these spores are released from this part of the corn and then dispersed to other parts uh, of plants to infect them. All right, um, smut is edible. So you can actually buy this or you can uh, sometimes cook it. Usually in Mexico and other southern countries where they grow lots of corn. Um, and I haven't tasted this, but it'd be interesting to see if we could get some and eat it in class. All right, another very common and devastating fungal disease is called the chestnut blight. And this is kind of a bit of American history. So American chestnut, Castania dentata, was once a, an abundant tree all over the southeastern United States. So this is its native range. You can see this here. Um, <clears throat> and then a fungus was, which originated in Chinese chestnut trees was introduced with Asian chestnuts. And those are, they, and they are immune to the fungus. You know, they may infect it, but it, they can't take over and kill them. And this fungus forms cankers, these red spots and, um, the American chestnut does not have a defense against it and it will kill the whole tree except for the roots. So it'll kill the stem and the leaves and the branches and everything except the roots. And so we do have the remnants of American chestnuts in, in some root formations. Oh, sorry. And, um, and sometimes they will sprout, but eventually they will catch the chestnut blight and die. But uh, efforts to make a resistant hybrid are showing process. So they have crossed it with these Chinese um, uh, chestnuts to see if you can get a hybrid that will be resistant. The problem is the Chinese chestnut, um, it does not have the same morphology. So the American chestnuts are really great because they were big and they were straight and they produced a lot of these chestnuts. Um, but some of the other... Um, Asian forms are more, will form more branch, more bush-like appearances, and that's not what we want in the American chestnut. So they're trying to find a hybrid that has the same qualities of the American chestnut and the resistance, and it appears like there is, um, all efforts up to this point, they have grown some, um, but eventually they fall prey to the disease. Um, you can grow the the Asian chestnuts, but again, they don't have the same qualities as the American. Um, and there's actually a stand that appears, and we will um, we'll talk about this in class. There's a stand that appears in um, a national forest, actually very close to here, where they have created this hybrid, which may have the the, the qualities necessary to survive and have those tall and straight qualities as well. All right, so that's it for fungus. I just want to briefly mention lichens, which are a mutualistic relationship between a fungus and an algae or a fungus and a um, cyanobacterium. <clears throat> and so the cyanobacterium or the algae is what provides the photosynthetic um, sugars for the fungus. And the fungus protects them from harmful light intensities and absorbs and retains water and minerals. So there's uh, a relationship between the two allows them to grow together and they form these lichens. And you can see these all over trees and rocks and other things. Three genera of algae and one genus of cyanobacterium are in 90% of all species. And then the other 10% are different combinations of both. And each lichen has its own unique species of fungus, which is usually a sac fungus. And they are usually identified according to their fungus because that's the unique, the neat, unique part. All right, moving on to protists. The protists are less than a billion years old. 
they were uh, originally confined to oceans, but then, uh, and what kept organisms from going onto the land was desiccation or drying out, the exposure to UV radiation, so water absorbs a lot of that UV radiation, and then the high temperatures. So, um, but <clears throat> protists could thrive very easily in water because they could easily just absorb nutrients through them. But about 400 million years ago, a green algae broke through somehow and, and gained some of the properties which allowed it to not dry out and it made the transition from water to land. And it's from there you get, you had an evolution, evolutionary events which led to the rise of green plants. Okay, and it's we hear that, oh, I'll talk about it later. So protists are from the domain eukarya, so they're eukaryotes which includes our animals and plants and fungi. They have unicellular and multicellular. So here's a colonial form called Volvox. Here's a single-celled form, um, Paramecium. They can, some of them can photosynthesize. Some of them are, have to ingest their food. Some of them can do both. And their life cycles are very considerably. They can be asexual and or sexual or both in their lifestyle as well. There are several groups of algae, including there's green algae, red algae, brown algae, um, and these are multicellular for the most part. Some of them are unicellular. Um, and they differ based on their chlorophyll and pigments being used, other pigments, and their food reserves. All right, so the common ancestor to all plants appears to be something similar to coleocate. Coleocates. Okay, they are likely the indirect ancestor of land plants, and they share features such as they have uh, cells that resemble a parenchyma, parenchymal cells. They develop a cell plate during mitosis, okay, with their cell walls. They have a protective covering for their zygote, and <clears throat> they uh, produce lignin, a lignin-like compound, which lignin is found in many plants in their cell walls as well. All right, so a couple of fungal diseases which have economic importance include uh, Plasmopera viticola, which was a grape plant uh, parasite, and it causes this downy mildew. I'll show in a second. Okay, so powdery mildew is caused by fungus. A downy mildew is caused by a protist. And this collapsed the French wine industry in the 1800s. Couldn't figure out how to... Um, get a defense against it. Um, an even more infamous protist infection is caused the potato blight. Phytophthora infestans, uh, it infects all parts of the potato, the stalks and the stems, and decays them into this dark brown black slime. Um, and what this did was it reduced potato yields considerably, which led to a famine in uh, Ireland called the Irish potato famine. So Ireland was heavily um, dependent on these potatoes, and so um, you know that was their main crop. And so when it, this blight came through, it killed significantly, decreased the crop yield. A lot of people starved, and it led to a lot of immigration of these starving people. When they did a little research, they found that this strain that caused the potato blight appeared to start in Mexico. Um, where potatoes were originally found and then went throughout the US then went worldwide and finally came to the Ireland and affected the Irish crops um, The strain that caused this finally died out in the 1970s. So um, It's not as big a problem as it used to be and also um, <clears throat> We've done a lot of back crossing and found different resistant types of potatoes Here's uh, an example of the leaves of the potato which has the potato blight 